PCS Insurance Group, Florida Paints, Centennial Bank, and Crown Roofing. While we allow everyone time to adjust their Zoom settings, we have just a few items to announce. This may be the first BMI event for many of you. Our organization was established by community managers for education resources. We focus on providing a comfortable environment for managers to learn while also introducing CAMS to ethical service providers who specialize in the industry. Today we are presenting a one-hour accredited online course. For those of you who would like to receive a credit for this course, please listen carefully. If you have registered on the BMI website and received the link directly from us, you are all set. However, if someone shared the link with you and you have not registered your attendance with BMI, please go to our website at bmitampa.org. Again, that's bmitampa.org, and do so before the end of the day. We are only allowing a course credit for those who registered on the BMI website and who are in attendance during the full webinar. Again, thank you to our sponsors for supporting Manager Education with BMI Tampa. We want to remind you of our summer virtual raffles going on. You can visit our website or LinkedIn and Facebook pages to find out more information or you can email us. We are raffling off e-gift cards weekly. Please make sure you check our website regularly because we are updating our webinar schedule weekly through mid-September. Just a few quick housekeeping tips before we get started here today. Your chat button will be down here in your bottom screen. Please make sure that if you want to ask a question that you do click on it. Now, reminder, um, not sure if it will be automatically set to everyone so that when you send a chat message, everyone, all of the participants can see it. You, if you want to just send a private message, you'll just click this and go down and pick the person you want to uh, speak with. If you're having te technical difficulties, I do recommend that you choose me and hit send me a private message. I'll do all that I can to help you. And we will be opening up for Q&A towards the end of the session. At that point, I will unmute everyone. But in order for you to be heard by us, you will have to probably unmute yourself automatically on your end as well if you haven't already. So that should do it. Enjoy the webinar, everyone. All right, perfect. We'll go ahead and get started. We'll uh, start slow here, see if anybody else trickles in. Um, my name is Chris Perez. I'm with Specialized Pipe Technologies. Uh, we're going to be giving this course on plumbing system basics and pipe life extension today. Um, I'm try to make it as interactive as we can. Obviously, it's a little tough, but um, Carrie, there's gonna be a couple times, maybe throughout the um, course here, if I just ask you to unmute somebody, if they have a response to the question, we'll try that out, see if it works. Okay. All right, here we go. What, to, what you're gonna expect from this CEU. Um, we're gonna learn about how multi-unit plumbing works. We're going to introduce you to the three most common water and sewer drain pipe problems and obviously receive some uh, information to help you guys out in the future. Um, we'll focus mainly on drain pipes. We're going to talk briefly about water pipes, but uh, you know in this class it's going to be mostly about drain. First opening question where I will ask Carrie to unmute any of you if you raise your hand or um, so you've got a question or an answer. Uh, does anybody in this CEU know what type of pipe pipe was used to plumb your building's water, uh, sewer, or wastewater systems? If anybody has a an answer for that, we can uh, unmute you real quick so you can let us know or type it in the chat. And all the second part to that question would be thinking past. Thinking back over the last couple of years, six months, whatever, if you've had a common pipe problem or a pipe emergency, uh, now would be a good time to uh, share your story and we can talk about it. Nobody has anything, we'll just keep it moving. So the definition of plumbing. Definition of plumbing is described, it's the system of pipes uh, required for the water supply, heating, and sanitation in a building. What I like to say is in the beginning, uh, on the back side of this slide, you can see it looks like a condo building or it could be a commercial building. 
and you can see the plumbing inside. This would be the wastewater plumbing that you see. Um, and you'll see multi-levels here. You'll see the fixtures as well as the pipes coming to and from them. The sanitation part is all the water that leaves those fixtures and leaves the building. Those would be sanitary pipes. Anything coming in would be so called supply lines. Anything coming to from outside the building into it to feed those fixtures and anything else that's in the building would be the supply side. What I like to try to do is equate the fundamentals of the plumbing system to a tree. That way everybody knows um, it's a base. Everybody's seen a tree, knows about a tree, has touched and felt the tree. Um, so here you can see the layout of the tree and some of the terms on the tree. And next couple slides, we'll, we'll show you guys how those interact with what a tree would, would be. So the trunk, the main line of the, the trunk, the tree trunk that comes up, we would, what we would call is a main or it could also be called a stack. Um, it goes up vertically or it could be horizontally and um, you know, feeds kind of all the rest of the, the tree. The branches are what we would call the lateral lines in plumbing. So those come off of that main line and they start heading over toward where the, the bathrooms, kitchens, and any other fixtures could be. The twigs on the tree would equate to each fixture. So that would be the uh, bathroom group. So you could have one lateral coming off and then feed one bathroom group and another bathroom group. And then finally, you get the leaves, which would be the plumbing fixture itself. So that would be the toilet, the sink, the shower, water fountains, anything like that. So if you can, if you can think about your plumbing system and equate it to a tree, hopefully it'll help you visualize what the inside of the plumbing system looks like because it's all obviously mostly behind walls, in floors, and it's hard to kind of grasp what it looks like. Here you'll see a definition of a pipe. It's a tube, metal, plastic, or any other material used to convey these substances um, that could be uh, coming or going. So that could be the supply or the drain side. We're gonna talk about the most common plumbing materials used in the last 50 years. Metal. Metal is used for both supply and drainage side. Um, we won't talk much about ductile iron. That's usually used in uh, hospitals and, and big commercial buildings like that. So we'll skip past that. But galvanized, you'll, uh, some property managers might have had experience with. Um, it was typically used down here for water lines. And we'll go into a slide in the, uh, going forward about how it was used. Copper is a... A good material, it's typically, again, down here used for water. Up north a lot, they've used it for <clears throat> drain as well back in the day, and then cast iron. These are your basic types of metal pipe that you'll run into um, when you're looking throughout the plumbing in, your, in the building. Clay, clay's a very good pipe, and it was used uh, all, always for drain. It can be used for sewer and storm drain. Clay's a very good material. Uh, for drains, it's lasted a long time. It can be fragile. If you think of clay pipe, it's ceramic, like uh, somebody might have some ceramic plates and, and pots and stuff. So it can be fragile if dropped. And same thing with clay pipe. It stays very smooth for a long time, which is nice. Um, it doesn't uh, catch debris like cast iron does, and it doesn't rust as cast iron does. The problem you'll find with clay is every five feet, it was, it's put together with joints. And a lot of times every year, those joints would give out and that's what allows roots into the system. And once a root starts getting into that joint, what it'll do is start breaking the clay. And then you'll start getting sand and everything else that's from outside the pipe, inside the pipe, that, which could cause blockages. Cement, reinforced concrete pipe, is used uh, typically for storm drainage. Um, you'll see that a lot out throughout the properties. And it's also a good pipe. Lasts a long time, but has the same issues that clay has as far as where they're put together with the joints. A lot of times they'll just use some sort of mortar to join the two cement pipes together. And that's where we typically see those go bad. Plastic is, is a new type of pipe that's being used on the water 
supply and on the drainage side. There's, you'll see different types of plastic here. The regular PVC, the first one listed, is a white, usually white. It can be black, um, which is ABS. It's just a different type of PVC. But mostly down here, you'll see PVC and comes in different schedules or thicknesses. You can have schedule uh, 35 or schedule 40. And then you can also have DWV and pressure PVC. PVC can also be used on the water supply side, but never on the hot. It can only be used on the cold side uh, because it's not rated for the hot water. ABS, we won't talk about a lot. That's basically a black PVC. It's used a lot out west and sometimes up north. Then CPVC is typically always used for the water supply line. You can see it has a similar uh, similarities to PVC, but it is rated for hot water. Um, it usually comes in smaller diameters, half inch to uh, let's say two inch. PEX is a new, newer type of system that's been brought around in the last few years. It's a uh, plastic material that's very bendable and pliable, and that is always used on the water supply side, not the drain side. Lastly, HDPE, we're not going to talk a whole lot about. Um, some companies can use HDPE for drain pipes and water, and it can be used for a process called pipe splitting. We're not going to really talk about that a whole lot. I'll touch on it briefly. It's when you actually pull a brand new pipe through the old pipe and it bursts, or it could be called pipe splitting, pipe bursting. It actually bursts the old pipe out of the way and it takes the trail of the old pipe and, and drops in that HDPE pipe. This is what most people are gonna to relate to um, on older buildings on the water side here. It's uh, called galvanized steel. Galvanized steel was a good material used for a long time. The problem is, as you can see in the right hand photo, is that it starts to rust and corrode over time. And we'll talk about corrosion coming forward. Um, if you can imagine if your building has galvanized pipe, uh, the inside of that pipe is typically what you're going to be using for your drinking water, showering water. Um, not that it's really dirty. It looks kind of gross. It's just rust. Um, sometimes after sitting for a while, you go to turn the water on, you'll get a brown or rust colored water out of it to, till it flushes out. That rust is always going to be there. Um, and it can sometimes get caught in the aerators of the building. So if you have galvanized and you're having low water pressure, it's typically because that pipe is getting corroded like that, choked down to where there's not as much water flow through it. And also those little pieces of metal can start clogging the aerators uh, at the fixtures and start causing those to slow down. A little later after galvanized, um, hard and soft copper started being used. This is from the 60s until uh, present. It says 1980, but people are still using um, copper water lines. It's a good material. It doesn't do well with the water down here in Florida. For some reason, the water in Florida is more acidic or has more chemicals in it, so it will cause a lot of pinhole leaks in copper. Um, copper is almost always used in commercial applications, especially when it comes to hospitals and commercial buildings and new construction today. Copper lasts a long time, you typically don't have problems with it, and it's very sturdy. Um, but again, it will start getting those, if you look at that picture, you'll see that there's a lot of corrosion built up in there, and, and that will eventually lead to pinhole leaks. And from the water side, we're going to switch over to drain and sewer pipe. Um, right here, you'll see a good example of some cast iron pipe. Cast iron, again, was a very good pipe. It's, it's lasted a long time. I know we're getting people freaking out right about now talking about um, lawsuits, et cetera, with the cast iron because it's failing. But, I mean, if you think about yourself and, and uh, you know, when 50 years ago when this stuff was put in, it was brand new, just like you 50 years ago were a lot younger and more agile. And now your body is just not like it was back then. So uh, me personally, I think cast iron's kind of done its job and it's just ended the, the life expectancy of it. Um, cast iron's a pretty good pipe. The problem we run into cast iron, as you see here, uh, the top right picture, you'll see it's filled with a lot of dirt and debris. We see that a lot in the plumbing industry. We see um, cast iron getting scaled up and a lot of times tree roots coming down through the, through the cast iron. What happens is once cast iron cracks, it allows the tree root 
what it wants to do is it wants to find water. That's all these tree roots want to do. They're not really just picking on your pipes. They are just looking for water. So they're going to look, I've seen tree roots go 35 feet away to penetrate a, a, a cast iron pipe um, or clay pipe, just because that's all they're trying to do is find water. And if you think about it in the sanitary system, water is constantly flowing through there. Every time you flush the toilet, run your sink, you're going to have water in there. Um, so the, the, the roots are gonna get, find that penetration and get into it. Commonly people ask, well, why do I have roots? I don't have a tree, but it's on the other side of my house. Well, I've seen roots travel that far to get into the pipe. Um, a lot of times that scale buildup will also cause uh, backups because if you look at that bottom right picture, you'll see that uh, there's not a very smooth passage. So when we're thinking about sanitary, we're thinking about everything that you flush down that toilet. So paper, a lot of times will get caught. If you even think about um, when you're showering, little pieces of hair, eventually what that does is it starts catching onto those rough surfaces and it'll eventually build a dam. Typically, you would have a plumber come out and snake it, which is great, it'll clear the blockage, but it really doesn't um, scour the outside of that, the inside of that pipe and get it clean. Um, it's more of a temporary fix when you have the traditional plumbers come by and snake those pipes. After 1990, most people started switching to uh, plastic from metal. There's a few reasons for this. Uh, one of the reasons is cost. When we think about cost, it's not only the cost of material, because metal is much more expensive than plastic, but also the cost of labor. If you think about the cast iron, it's very heavy. Um, it takes a lot to install it. Back then, you had to uh, lead and oakum the joints. Uh, so you had to have a torch, you had to have lead, you had to pour the lead around there, wait for it to uh, soften up or to harden up, and then you can move on. With plastic, they're able to just glue the fittings together, and it's a very quick process. So you save on your labor, you save on your material, it's all in all a, a cheaper uh, alternative, and it supposedly lasts a very long time. Um, plastic stays smooth, it doesn't allow for the buildup like uh, the metals do when they start rusting or corroding. And you typically don't have much trouble with plastic. Only thing we run into a lot with plastic is uh, pitch issues, or a lot of time because it's not as solid as the metal, it can start to sag. And if you'll hear any plumber talking about or any uh, pipe rehabilitation company talking about uh, a sag in the pipe or a belly, that's because that, that plastic is just kind of sagging down and it's holding water. So if you think about it, but you want the, the pitch to be nice, slow, and constant, when it's coming down and it sags, it holds water. So that's gonna be a stopping point for any solids or um, material like paper to get kind of stuck in and again, build that dam that we just talked about. Sorry guys. So we'll go with our first question. If you can use the chat feature here, um, what was the most common type of water pipe used in multi-story construction before 1960? If you're thinking about water pipe back in the 60s, um, that was before any of this other plastic that you see. And then obviously cast iron is not a water pipe. So the answer here would be B. The most common water pipe used in multi-story construction was galvanized steel before 1960. Second trick question here we got today is what was the most common type of sewer pipe before 1980? Again, uh, before 1980, we didn't have the plastics. Um, so that can rule out one of those. But the answer for this one would be cast iron. The most common type of sewer pipe is cast iron before 1980. When we briefly touched on pinhole leaks on copper, this is what a pinhole leak on copper looks like. You can see this slide. You see the greenish substance around the, the oxidation around the copper on the left. Eventually what it does is it makes that copper pipe thin and with copper being under constant pressure It'll eventually poke a hole through and you'll get that pinhole leak Here's a description of corrosion. It's breaking down a material and it's typically on metal It's where the uh, chemical reactions happen again, which uh, down here in Florida We have a lot of chemicals in our drinking water and that is very abrasive on the copper up north, uh, they seem to have a better water quality. That's why down here, you'll see a lot more water softeners, um, where typically up north, water softeners aren't as big of a thing. 
Um, the water quality down here is just poor when it comes to copper. So that's why almost every plumber nowadays is, is doing everything but plastic. Here's another example of a pinhole leak here on the copper. You'll see this is a, a copper fitting with a 90. It typically doesn't happen on the fitting. It's normally on the pipe. The reason being is the fittings are always thicker material than the pipe is. Uh, I don't know the exact reason. I'm going to assume because they have to bend it and they don't, they need it to be thicker. Um, but here's some results that will happen because of corrosion. You get water leaks, poor water quality, like we talked about with the galvanized. And again, lower water pressure. So if you can think uh, on both ends of this, copper or galvanized, the lower water pressure on galvanized is going to be the, the corrosion inside the pipe because it's, it's blocking off the passageways. Whereas the lower water pressure in the copper is because now you're shooting water out of that hole. Now granted, you should find it pretty quickly to show up in some drywall, unfortunately, or in somebody's unit, um, but sometimes not. It could be a low leak and it's just causing your pressure to not be as strong as normal. So the point of that is if you start uh, seeing any sort of water pressure fluctuations, you should probably start, start looking at some of these causes. And sewer pipe, um, right here we're looking at a piece of cast iron. That's a really good example. This actually came off of somebody's condo. Um, it's pretty bad shape. As you can see, all that rust layers build up. So what happens is it starts rusting in layers. Um, if you look at the top right and kind of bottom left of this picture, you'll see where there's multiple layers of this rust. So a common misconception is uh, somebody says, well, we're snowboard community. We're only using it half the time, we should only, we should get twice as much use out of our cast iron. Well, that is false because cast iron likes to be wet. It like, it, if it stays wet, there's less chance of it scaling and rusting like that because it's in constant use. What happens is when the snowbirds uh, go out of town, that starts getting a, li a layer of rust built around it. And then that rust hardens, they, everybody comes back, um, they start using their facilities. And then again, in six months, they go back out everything dries up, it rusts another layer. Um, sometimes what can happen is now when people start coming back and start flushing things, it starts knocking off pieces of those scales and that's, that can cause a backup at a lower unit or a unit down line. So here we'll see what happens with corrosion in um, metallic sewer pipe. You'll get some cracking, slow drainage, blockage, stoppages. These are all red flags. If you get any slow drainage, blockages, or stoppages, a, you probably want to get a plumber out there because they can respond more than uh, pipe rehabilitation companies. They can get there a little quicker. Uh, but, you know, if there's, you know, you get, you get somebody out there to, to, to clear the blockage, you kind of want to follow up with a really good camera inspection. We'll talk about the camera inspections coming soon. Now we're going to talk about the differences uh, between traditional pipe replacement and uh, pipe lining or rehabilitation. Um, this is a good slide. You can see here, you can see in the background, you see the cracked cast iron in the wall. Um, so when we look at this, we say, when pipes are starting to leak, what are our options? Well, what, not only what are your options, but what are the steps? So usually when we're doing this in person, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to people and it's kind of weird just talking to the screen by myself, but if somebody can answer in the chat kind of what this, so if you had a leaking pipe, what are you gonna do? What, what's the first thing you're gonna do? Um, the first thing we're probably gonna do is uh, maybe call a plumber. That would probably be a good starting point. Maybe we're gonna call our uh, insurance company. Uh, might have to call water restoration company. So as you see, you know, the small crack or a large crack, as you can see in this slide, could cause a lot of damage, a lot of confusion, a lot of aggravation. So the point is, um, you know, if we can not cause any more damage or any more uh, headaches with a pipe restoration or lining over traditional replacement, which we'll talk about here going soon, um, you know, let, let's, let's try to do that. And I think a lot of the problems is people just don't know about pipe replacement. So what is the difference between conventional pipe replacement. And when I say conventional, I'm talking about ripping the old stuff out and putting new PVC in and non-destructive pipe restoration, which could be lining, pipe splitting, epoxy coating. Um, 
I like to think of of conventional pipe replacement as almost being a last option. Or if you think about the differences, it would be the difference between a flip phone and a smartphone. You know, the, the flip phone works and it's good, but in, in today's technology and today's standards, the smartphone, um, you know, is, is just more common and, and more used. So although the flip phone works, and again, the conventional pipe replacement works, um, the smartphone and non-destructive replacement would almost be a better option most of the time. In conventional pipe replacement, everything between you and the pipe needs to be removed in order to get to the pipe. So this is a good example. This looks like a restaurant. Um, they, they could have had some failing pipes. It made a complete mess inside of this restaurant. Um, you can see where they got new pipes going in, that new PVC we talked about. Um, and it, you got dirt piled up everywhere. I actually went to somebody's uh, residential home not too long ago that their home looked like this. So um, the only thing why we got called out or uh, was that they couldn't get to one part because it was under their footer. Um, and when I walked in, I wish I would have took a picture. The lady, after explaining to her that, you know, pipe lining could have been an option, was completely defeated because her house was destroyed. So that being said, um, you know, traditional pipe replacement has its place. I like to say, if you can see it, feel it, touch it. If it's outside, if it's in a garage, exposed, that would be the best option for conventional pipe replacement. Anything in a wall and a slab, um, you know, that's tough to get to, the conventional pipe replacement should be your last resort. Again, pipe lining and epoxy coating isn't for every situation. Sometimes that pipe's too far gone where it cannot be rehabilitated and it has to be conventionally replaced. But a lot of times with camera inspections that we'll talk about in the future and, and uh, going forward in this presentation, you can catch that stuff before it gets that bad. Non-destructive pipe restoration. Um, there's a few things you can use cured in place uh, pipe lining, CIPP. See the cast iron on the left would be after it was cleaned and the cast iron on the right is after a liner was put into it. You can also do epoxy coatings as well. Um, it brings it back to the uh, original uh, size without any problems of destruction and, and damaging the units or condos. A little bit about pipe lining. So uh, on this slide, it, it's, it's uh, a little untrue. So it can be done for an inch and a half. Most companies will, will go down to just two inch, and then again, up to 36 inch pipe diameter size. Now with the lining technologies, there's some uh, contractors that are working for the city that they'll actually line up to uh, 72 or 96 inch pipe. Carries a good warranty. Most manufacturers have a 10 year uh, manufacturer labor or manufacturer's warranty and a 10 year labor warranty. Most pipe replacements in Florida, the Florida statute says that the plumbers only have to give you a one year warranty. So typically that's what the plumbers do. They'll give you a one year warranty, whereas here you get 10 years. So the warranty is better. It has an estimated service life of 75 to 100 years, which is also good. Hopefully that stuff will outlive me. Pressurized water lines, I won't talk a whole lot about this. There is systems out there for it. You're looking at a galvanized pipe here. Obviously, one on the left is full of corrosion and rust. The one on the right has been epoxy coated. Um, I don't like to talk about this a whole lot because I don't believe the technology is there yet for it to be perfect on anything smaller than two inch pipe. And the reason I say that is because anything less than two inch, you cannot get a camera in there to verify that that has been done really well. I've seen problems with this epoxy coating on water lines where it's completely blocked off half inch or three quarter lines. And then again, you gotta go through and cut it all out anyways. So I would say anything under two inch, it's better just to get it um, cut out and replaced. Anything over, um, you know, you can start looking at the epoxy lining for potable stuff. Here we'll talk about some advantages of pipe rehabilitation. So again, it's trenchless and it's non-destructive. So you don't have to tear up the floor. You don't have to get into the wall. You don't have to deal with paint. Only time that's different is on high rise buildings. Um, you can drop a liner for about 50 feet. So if you have a 10 story building, you will have to make access one per stack around halfway. So let's say the fifth or sixth floor. But again, it's still better than 
having to access every single unit all the way down. Um, it's less disruptive and faster. So uh, once the pipeliners drop in place, it takes three to four hours to cure. As soon as that uh, inner bag uh, or the inner tube is pulled out, you can go right to flushing the pipes, which is nice. One good thing that's not talked about here is uh, no permits. As of now, there's no permits required, so you don't have to get the city involved in your business. We can kind of come do your thing and get out of the way. Whereas with traditional pipe replacement, everything's permitted and has to be inspected, especially with COVID stuff going on now. The less interactions you can have with people outside, the better. Um, it avoids damages, not only to buildings, but landscape. And I said, you know, if it's outside, it should be dug up. Well, the, 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 the caveat to that would be if you have beautiful landscaping, um, you know, you probably don't want to dig into the grass or if there's tree roots involved. Um, parking lots, that goes uh, pretty much unsaid. Why tear up all the asphalt and concrete? You don't have to. Um, and any reconstruction costs. So even if the pipe repair or lining compared to the actual pipe replacement is the same, it's typically cheaper. But what, what makes the job even more expensive would be putting back that drywall, putting back the paint, any wallpaper, crown molding, stuff like that, cleaning, uh, anything involved with that. Um, so if you can imagine, if you refer back to that other picture, um, you know, there's gonna be a lot of dust created. It's a long-term solution, and like I said, little to no access. Again, access is coming into play more on high-rise buildings than, than you know, two or three-story condos. Here's just some uh, traditional pipe repair stuff. Basically, again, it's disruptive. Um, remodeling, reconditioning. Um, again, with the code, you have to, if you're changing any pipe, it has to be up to code. One thing I didn't touch on was, especially in high rise buildings or multi story, if you take that cast iron out, that is, uh, cast iron is a very sound dampening pipe. So if you're on a high rise building and somebody takes out the cast iron to replace it with PVC, um, now, every, every time a unit above that unit where it's been replaced flushes their toilet, they will actually hear the water come down through the walls, and it's very annoying. We've actually had to go through and um, line through that to try to help people um, reduce the noise. So the big thing is, again, with the noise. Um, cast iron, if you're lining it, will still retain its thickness and sound dampening qualities, and the liner just makes it that much better. Our third question of the day is metallic sewer pipe corrosion. Uh, oh, a metallic sewer pipe. Well, that doesn't make any sense, whoever wrote this. Anyways, um, the answer to this one would be D. So if you have corrosion in those metal pipes, um, it, all three of those above could happen. Again, if uh, you see slow drainage or stoppages happening, let's, let's work on getting that thing inspected. So pipe lining allows home and condo owners to avoid the problems below. Um, some of these are pretty funny, actually. Uh, if you can get the answer, uh, hopefully you know what the answer is. It is A. Uh, pipe lining avoids disruption, disruption, and downtime. It might help tooth decay and, and your neighbor stealing Wi-Fi. I don't know. There's no science to that, but we'll see what happens. We're going to talk about camera inspections and CCTV. Um, I really like the first line of the slide. It says, seeing is believing. Believing is crossed out and saying knowing. That is because I like to tell people the camera does not lie. I've had people try to argue with us about, uh, I'm not pouring grease down my drain, et cetera, on a high rise. Well, when we drop the camera down that stack, when you see the grease coming out, the camera has a locator on it and it can locate exactly at what depth that stack is on or that lateral is tying in. If you think about the branch again, going back to the tree, tying into the uh, trunk. Um, the camera does not lie. I had a guy arguing with his board saying I'm not putting grease down my drains because they've had them cleaned out. And of course, because it's a, a board problem, because it's in the wall, they're having to pay the cost. Well, they had, um, had us come out. We took a look. We were able to locate. It was a 10-story building, I believe. This was coming in at the sixth floor, out of the sixth floor kitchen. I like to say camera don't lie. So, once the, the flip side to that is, you know, once you do camera things, you're kind of held responsible now because you know. Um, you can't look past these uh, 
you know, anomalies in your pipe and, and you're kind of responsible for getting them fixed. But again, if you can catch it early, um, it, it could help decrease your any insurance premiums or uh, insurance claims. I like this slide a lot. This uh, stuff on the right was stuff we actually got off of jobs. Um, so I try not to talk that about plumbers, but the slide on the top right was actually pulled off of one of my jobs. It, uh, they were having backup issues and, and didn't know why. They had a plumber out to clear the drains and, and snake them. Well, the plumber snake got stuck, as you can see on that type right, top right uh, screenshot. And he actually cut the snake and left the job. So this, fortunately for them, I think it would have been about a year till they started having backups. That is a four inch pipe with a snake going right through it. Um, so we were able to mark and locate that. Unfortunately, it was uh, between a unit and their outside walkway. So the concrete had to be cut to get it out. But uh, anyways, got it out, got them cleared. Um, so again, the camera can find more things than you can imagine. The one on the bottom right is the bottom of a stack. And that is just debris coming in and uh, has everybody putting stuff down the sinks or flushing toilets. Anyways, at the bottom of your stack, it kind of comes out in 90s to, to go out of the building. And a lot of times that's what we find, the bottom of the stack being completely blocked up with uh, stuff. So you can imagine water will still drain through there, albeit slowly. Um, so you sometimes won't even see a backup, but uh, you know, we were called out to this one just because they had a backup and we found the reason why. Here's some benefits of getting the inspections done, more than we just talked about. Um, I'm gonna go through those real quick. Uh, main thing is verifying the pipe material. So, you know, a lining company would wanna know if it's clay or is it cast iron, is it concrete? You're gonna need to know the depth, um, the depth and the location of it. Like I said, most camera companies can, uh, they have a sond or sort of a locating beacon on the front of that camera. Wherever it stops, you can take a wand and go out and find it, mark it, either with a flag or some paint. Um, it'll help you identify problem areas. So a lot of times we get called out to a condo association, and let's say it's, you know, 10 stories and they've got 50 stacks. Well, the common misconception is that every single pipe is going to need a uh, great question, BMI. I will answer you here in a second. Um, not every single pipe would need to be re rehabilitated. So commonly what we find is that, uh, you know, let's call 50 stacks. We cameraed all 50 of them. It's good to do it all at once. Um, what a good, good company will do is go through and instead of scaring the, the, the board and the, the managers to death, they'll say, all right, well, let's break it down. So for example, most companies should have a rating system on the pipe and the stacks and then they'll give the company the video or they'll give the board the video and be able to have a board meeting and discuss it. So out of those 50 stacks, let's say, um, you know, the board is thinking worst case scenario, they're gonna have to line all 50 stacks. It's gonna be millions of dollars. Well, that's not always the case. Sometimes it is, but typically it's not. So normally what we'll find is uh, that, you know, out of those 50 stacks, maybe 20 looked great. There's no, uh, no nothing needed on them. And let's just say uh, 30 needs clean. That's a big number, but hey, 30 are going to be clean and um, you know reevaluated. And out of those 30, let's say uh, five to 10 need actual rehabilitation. So now you've taken this big number of 50 stacks and you've knocked it down to five or 10 that need rehabilitation. But you can budget going forward, saying, okay, well we know we have these problems. Uh, let's next year start tackling these other. 10 to you know five to ten and then the next year five to ten so that way you can just after you know five or six years now everything's lined and you're good to go uh, to answer your question Carrie the most common item found obstructing pipes would be um, it depends on the pipe so if we're talking about drain pipes typically what we're finding obstructing them is wipes flushable wipes um, those are really bad. A lot of times it's roots. Again, you get somebody by to clean out the roots, that's great. Uh, but what happens is you're only cutting the head off of the snake, so to speak. So you still got the rest coming behind it. 
So in another six months to a year, those roots are going to get back in because you've never actually sealed the crack. So that's where lining would come in. You would seal the crack and now the root cannot come in there. Um, we've found all sorts of things uh, from toys to cell phones, uh, old plumber snakes in the pipe. Um, the most effective thing you can do to avoid pipes backing up is routine maintenance. So that's getting the pipes uh, hydro jack clean. Again, that's, that's the difference between uh, the snaking and jetting. Jetting is going to scour that pipe. It's going to really clear everything out. I like to think of it like the dentist. Um, when they go in there with that little pick thing and they get in all the nicks and crannies, um, that's kind of what jetting is. Uh, where, like I said, the snake, punch a hole through it. It'll get you by in an emergency. It's very good to, you know, I'm not saying don't call a plumber. But if you have to call a plumber to clear a blockage, well, there's a reason for that blockage. Don't just let him take it and go on about his business. Call a company like ours or, or somebody else that actually deals with pipes and only pipes. Let's come out there and investigate what's going on and what's causing it. Chris. Yes. Have you seen any community do something that you thought, okay, that's a really good idea in regards to communicating with their residents on, hey, this is a kind of a game plan we like to put in place to help our pipes, and I'm talking outside of general maintenance, yeah, whether so, it's just a way um, to communicate. Just one quick story I could tell you is um, there's a community recently that um, was having pro a lot of problems with their kitchen stacks. Um, this was maybe two or three months ago. So what we found was going to board meetings, and, and I, I love doing board meetings, um, just to get information from people and, and talk to them and educate people, is every, a lot of people were using their garbage disposals uh, too much. So what I mean by that, and, and one thing I, I like to tell everybody is you got to scrape your stuff off the plate. Even if you have a garbage disposal, scrape it off into the garbage. The garbage disposal really should only be catching the, the minute scraps that you leave behind on your plate when washing them. So a lot of people were, are just dumping everything from their plate into the garbage disposal and running it. What that does is that will start, especially anything stringy, you know, carrots, uh, celery, stuff like that that's gonna start catching on the walls of the pipe and eventually blocking it off and causing a backup. Um, so this community actually was changing um, their documentation and they were actually taking all the garbage disposals out of their whole high rise um, because of these continued issues. Now, again, you can probably line them and uh, that would probably fix that problem because now it wouldn't have anything rough to stick on, but. That's one thing I can I can say is if you if you, if you have communities with garbage disposals, uh, just try to educate them on scraping everything into the. Uh, actually, I was just on the phone with the board president today. Same conversation. She was saying she has a uh, uh, once a year she's having a backup in her kitchen stack, and I was questioning her around, and she's like, "Well, yeah, I, I, I scrape my carrots off into the garbage disposal and, and send them down the way." I'm like, "Well, stop doing that." And this was the president, so you know, not everybody knows this. It's uh, unless you do it every day for a job. But I would say routine maintenance as far as jetting and mechanical cleaning is always good. Um, it's ex it could be expensive depending on the size of the community and the building, but what it will save you in the long run of any emergencies or again, insurance claims and things backing up, you know, is worth its weight in gold, I believe. I think the most common thing I've heard is people using lemon peels to freshen and make it smell better in the garbage disposal. And then I also heard one time that if you use coffee grounds. Yeah, coffee which, grounds are actually not very good for the garbage disposal because they clump up and they'll get stuck in the lines. So basically what I like to tell people, garbage disposal is dump a little ice down it, run your garbage disposal, that'll kind of clean the blades, clean the inside, and then obviously the ice melts. Um, I think you can use like a little vinegar or uh, bleach maybe, but again, you don't want to use anything abrasive uh, no liquid plumber in your drain lines. Um, that'll eat through the cast iron really bad. Anything like that, you don't want to use in there. So yeah, garbage disposals, just dump some ice in there, turn it on for a few seconds and uh, let it do its thing. Thank so, you. Yeah, no problem. Overview of non-constructive, um, here we go, liners, anywhere from two to 36 inch. So see somebody fix it on this slide from inch and a half to two inch, which is good. Um, the good thing about lining, too, that I didn't touch on 
uh, is spot repair liners. So what that means is with lining, um, I wouldn't say the 20, 20 or 36 inch, I would say typically point repairs are from like two to eight inch pipe. Um, what that means is if you have a high rise, let's say you have a, a eight story building and you only have a crack, let's say from the fifth to the fourth floor, you don't have to line that whole stack. Um, the good thing about lining is uh, I, I like to think of it like a, a doctor. If anybody knows anybody has had heart trouble, um, it's almost like putting a stent in. So basically the doctor will cut a hole in usually through your leg and they'll send the machinery up through your heart. They'll and put that stent in and then remove their equipment. Same thing with lining. So you can do sort of the same thing. So you can uh, drop a liner down, like I said, that 80 foot stack, let's say, and only line 20 feet if cost is the issue. Um, but it would still be less expensive than cutting those walls out. Um, so you can do point repairs or spot repairs on pipe. Now, most lining companies would have a minimum uh, to, to spend to do that. But again, still typically that minimum should cover 15 feet or so. Um, and then that way, you know, the, the flip side to that is that part of the stack started going bad. So how long until the next part of the stack goes bad? But if you're in a tight budgetary situation, um, you can at least get that spot fixed and then maybe next year budget in to do the rest of the stack. Um, building drains and sewer mains, you can also do roof drainage and storm drain systems, water mains, HVAC, uh, when we've done cooling towers, fire suppression systems, uh, brush coat epoxy is coming up now pretty big, it's really nice. Um, there's a lot of options. So the point is, uh, the, the point of this uh, uh, class is mainly to teach you about pipes, but also give you some uh, give you some other options. You know, everybody just thinks pipes broke, call plumber, dig, break open walls. Well, now hopefully you know that there's other solutions. And again, pipelining isn't for every single situation, but it is for most. Um, here, I think this is uh, one more question after this, but this is our uh, one of our last questions. What does Ackerman CIPP stand for? That would be cured in place pipe. Last question here would be a high quality inspection helps owners uh, make informed decision. It really wouldn't tell you the plumber. It wouldn't tell you whether or not your kitchen, but it will tell you about pipe maintenance, repairs, and rehab solutions and options. Here's a good slide. What can a proactive property manager do to protect their buildings? Here's a couple things. Um, if a property is 25 years or older, the reason we say that is because it probably has cast iron or clay or concrete piping, schedule a uh, camera inspection. Um, get your stacks done, get the undergrounds done. It's gonna give you a lot of information. <clears throat> um, start implementing a program for maintenance like we talked about, um, whether it's jetting, cleaning, just more inspections. Again, the more inspections, the more you know, the quicker you catch these things, the more money you'll save the board. I know a lot of times boards, um, you know, they like to spend money on things they can see. Paint, landscaping, asphalt, roofs. Those are all very important, but a lot of those things won't really cost you a lot of money if they fail. You know, if the paint looks ugly, yes, it's ugly, but it's not gonna cost the, the board or the insurance company a lot of money if there's an incident. If you have a black water incident in the, somebody's unit, they're going to uh, be very upset. It's going to be very disgusting and gross, and it's going to cost a lot of money. Lastly, maybe start a reserve fund. Um, a lot, again, a lot of condos and boards are focusing on things that you can see. Um, the pipes, you know, a lot of times get forgotten about. So until there's a problem, nobody thinks about it. Um, so it's very important to start thinking and talking about it. If you don't do something this year, uh, start at your budget meetings at the end of this year, start talking about next year and how you're going to um, do those. I'll show you guys a couple samples here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see myself. And so this is what a good piece of cast iron, oh, let, me turn, let me turn my background off so you can see it. I was gonna say, put it in front of yourself. Yeah, so this is what a, actually a pretty decent piece of cast iron would look like. But you can see in here, this is the uh, scale build up. You can see how rough the edges are. I mean, if we were inspecting this, we'd probably say, ah, you're pretty good. It could use a cleaning. But as you can see, these rough edges on the bottom, you can see how those would start catching uh, hair and paper and debris. 
um, that same piece of pipe after being lined, this is what it would look like. So this is what the liner looks like. I get a lot of people that ask me, uh, you know, how thick is it? Is it going to really uh, choke down the pipe? Well, as you can see, it's not very thick. It's thick enough uh, to provide support. It is structural. Um, and the other part is you can see how smooth that piece of pipe is now. So you can, you can go from that roughness to that smoothness, and everybody's happy. And that, my friends, concludes this CU presentation. We can answer any other questions if anybody has them. Uh, and the angel I'm gonna, stuff. Yes. I'm going to, um, you do sell that? Yeah, that angels. Was one of the, go ahead, I'm sorry. Angel Soft, Charmin, a lot of those, although they feel good on your hiney, they uh, do clog up the sewers more than not. So a lot of times you'll see our guys, um, sometimes on the reports you'll see uh, that we recommend Scott or any other sort of non as thick paper. Again, uh, it just all depends on the situation with your pipes. If they're very rough, that thicker paper is gonna catch you know, more. If your pipes are smooth, and let's just say they're lined, you can probably get away with the Charmin or, or any other nicer brand of toilet paper. So the point, what the question that I asked him, guys, was um, I had heard one time that Angel Soft was the best toilet paper to use because it does break down easier in the plumbing system. But you're yeah, saying one no. The worst that's ones a, is, one of the worst ones is Charmin. Um, like I said, fortunately, it feels feels great on your hiney, but uh, it does clog up the sewers a lot. I'm going to open up the poll now for the evaluation of this course. And if you guys would please go on there before you log out, make sure you fill out the course evaluation. And I'm also going to unmute everybody here. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them. If I can figure out how to do it, bear with me. Okay, you're all, on my end, you're all unmuted. So you might have to unmute yourself on your side. Do we have any questions? Well, it means I did my job. Nobody has any questions? You, they're shy today. <laughs> well, I thank everybody for coming. Uh, hopefully it didn't put anybody to sleep. Um, hopefully it was somewhat informative and if you have any questions you can reach out to me I'm glad to meet with you in person or via zoom with your board um, I really enjoy doing board meetings and just educating them on you know options and cleaning for sure thank you so much Chris we really appreciate your time today and I want to thank all the attendees for coming um, I saw some people did unmute did you guys have any questions Well, all righty then. All right. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And, and y'all will be on the lookout for a follow-up email. Thank you, guys. guys for thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend.